Well, hello everyone. It's my pleasure to visit with you today about an important topic called planning for a healthy business. Let me give you a little bit of, of a background on the program. This is the first module of the Small Business Certification Curriculum. And you can see the flyer there to the right. At the bottom of the page, you'll see our website, iimfl.org, and there's more information about the Small Business Certification on our website. This curriculum was developed by the FDIC, promoted by the SBA, and our nonprofit, the IIMFL, was exclusively selected to teach this small business certification curriculum to help improve financial literacy and access to capital. Now, what you'll really like, and I think you'll really appreciate about our approach, is that it's a four week curriculum. Each week we'll have a different topic, but then we're going to help you implement after we teach. So week one, which is now, is about planning. Week two is about business credit and credit overall, understanding more thoroughly the difference between personal credit and business credit and how to go about building business credit off of the EIN of your business rather than using your social security number. Week three is about financial management and important concepts and terms there. And then fourthly, we wrap it all up with banking and money. Now, what's uh, kind of implicit during this background is in truth, we'll be working with you over this four week process to build your loan package. So if you should decide to proceed with your business and you need additional capital, which we'll be talking a little bit about today and more over the next four weeks, we'll actually have the documents and resources all ready to go to funding after completion of the four week process. So a little background on myself, my name's Thomas Montgomery, I've been married for 25 years, have four children, live in Mineola, Texas, uh, which is where we're recording this this morning. And uh, my background, I have an MBA in strategic planning from the University of, of Minnesota, the Twin Cities campus. Also a master of healthcare administration, my mother was diagnosed with cancer when I was 14. She passed when I was 17, and I became very interested at an early age of kind of the, the intersection between healthcare and finance. And so that's uh, why I went down that educational path. Also, I have an undergraduate degree in business with the emphasis in accounting. I am a certified teacher by the Texas Education Association. And in fact, I used to be a high school teacher. I taught accounting and computer programming, Microsoft applications like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and economics at the high school level. As far as relevant experience, uh, I do host a weekly radio show. It's broadcast on FM channels across much of Texas, and then also uh, via internet globally. I'm a former full-time college professor, and so what's really neat is this material that we're talking about today is very much largely extracted from the semester-long course that I taught. So students would enroll at the college, pay their tuition, buy their textbook, and we would either offer it in person or online or a hybrid, and those students were doing much like what you're doing. Now, in this case, we're doing it in an accelerated pace, right? We're getting this done in four weeks where it took them a full semester to do it. I used to work for the SBDC, Small Business Development Center, which is funded by a grant from the Small Business Administration. So work with small businesses in a seven county area in East Texas to help educate and implement these same concepts that we're talking about over our four-week curriculum. Prior to that, I was a SCORE mentor in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I was actually responsible for a 14-county area, all the live workshops that we were doing. And first out of graduate school, I worked for, it was called Deloitte and Touche at the time. Now it's just simply called Deloitte and worked on large-scale financial projects. One of my first clients was the state of Florida. 
So not some business in the state of Florida, but the state of Florida was one of my clients. Now there's a number of resources that you'll have access to for this module. There's gonna be different resources for each of the four modules, but let's focus on this one on planning. You're gonna have access to this YouTube, of course. There's a participant's guide. That participant's guide is important. You should have it. If you don't have it, you should pause the recording and request it from us because we're going to be referring to it and there's information in that participant's guide that's not on these slides. So it's very important that you have that and use that. And then also, we wanna make sure that you have login access because we're not gonna just talk about planning, we're gonna help you develop a business plan, what we call a lender compliant business plan. It's one that meets banks requirements, the SBA's requirements uh, with the, the written verbiage as well as the financial projections. And so those are the three key resources for this module. The YouTube, which we're on now, a participant's guide, which you should pause if you don't have that, you're gonna need that to, to get the most out of this lesson today and log in access. Now, after you finish the second module, remember there's four modules, once you finish the second module or, or second class, then we'll actually assign a financial literacy educator who will work with you very closely. Now, you could meet in person with a financial literacy educator, talk to them on the phone, do Zoom-based uh, calls, but regardless, they're gonna be really involved with helping you with these subsequent steps. Now there is a pretest in your participants guide and we would like you to go complete that. So let me scan down and see what page that's on. It's towards the back of your participants guide. Looks like it's on page 23. And so this is a great way to evaluate what you've learned. Was this worthwhile or not? So you'll see on page 23 of your participant guide, there's the pre and the post test form. You're going to fill out the left hand side now so you can pause this recording and then after we're finished you'll fill out the right hand side and it may very well be that we'll ask you to, to submit this in because it's important for us to be doing a good job educating and that's some quantifiable feedback that we get from you uh, if it's working or not all right so let's go ahead and talk about the agenda so we're doing the welcome now, the pretest we just made reference to, the agenda and uh, learning objectives. We're going to be using Sophia as a case study. Now, Sophia may be much different from you, rather it be her type of business or where she's at in the planning process or many of other variables. But I think it's helpful to use a case study as we go through our conversation. So we'll get to know more about Sophia and her business model and her circumstances. We're going to learn about where you're at in the planning process. And again, that is going to be obtained through completion of a different section of the participants guide, but we'll talk about that more in a slide or two. We want you to become familiar with the four-step planning model. I think it's easy to sometimes assume, oh, all I need is a business plan. Well, we, we usually need to work up to the point of being ready to develop a business plan, and then our planning process doesn't stop once a business plan has been created. So we'll talk about those four steps, and we're here to help you with those four steps. And then we'll wrap it up with a su summary, post-test, and evaluation. As I mentioned, we want to apply what we've learned. So we'll spend our time now learning about the material, but then we're going to implement by helping you develop your business plan with financial projections. You may say, I already have a business plan, and that's great. You can reconcile if, if it's complete enough and thorough enough, or you might even be on the other end of the continuum and quite concerned and even intimidated about developing a business plan and financial projections, but no worries. We'll be helping you step-by-step step on that. Okay, so what are the learning objectives for this first of the four modules, which is part of the Small Business Certification Curriculum? 
We want to explain how an evolving planning process can help you make key decisions as a business owner. Because our goal is to help you successfully start and grow a small business. And those are really two different things, isn't it? Uh, some would argue it's easier to get started than to be successful and stay in business. And so through my time, especially working for the SBA, I would see small businesses that would get started but didn't have the proper planning or financial resources in place and they weren't able to sustain themselves. And we don't want that. We want to help you start and grow and be profitable. We're going to learn how to convert a vague idea into a resource plan. So again, you may be beyond that already, but for many of you that are early stage entrepreneurs, I think this will be a very helpful topic. We're going to explain the importance of healthy personal credit scores and healthy relationships with lenders and describe how a business plan helps you motivate stakeholders. Well, what's a stakeholder? A stakeholder is someone else that has a vested interest in your business. And so it could be your spouse or significant other because they're supporting you as, as you start this new endeavor. It could be certainly banks or lenders or investors. Those are all examples of stakeholders. If we don't have a well-written business plan, then it may be in your head, but it's not always easy to convey to others. We need to be able to reduce it to writing, and that's what we'll be doing. And we also, are going. another learning objective is to explain the benefits of creating a day-to-day -day action plan. And that's what I was making reference to earlier. Once the business plan and financial projections are created, that's, that should not be the end or the, the final step in the planning process. We need to continue to plan as we implement. All right, so let's go to page four of your participant guide. I won't be showing you that on the screen, but you should have it here in front of you. And let's introduce Sophia. And I'll, I'll read to you as uh, her, her beautiful picture there, and it has a couple paragraphs. Let me read that to you. It says, say hello to Sophia, the mother of two smart and hungry teenagers. Sophia has an idea to start a business repairing cell phones and small appliances. Her sons and several friends think it's a terrific idea, but Sophia has to plan. She needs to figure out how she will make money and how she'll finance or pay for her startup cost. Sophia needs to complete four steps in her planning. At each step, she asks and answers specific questions. As she progresses through the steps, the questions get more specific and the answers become more detailed. It took, took Sophia more than two years until she was able to quit her job, essentially replace her income, and begin working full-time for herself. So again, we're not saying that you need to quit your full-time job to own your own business. We're not saying that it's gonna take two years to get to the point that it took Sophia to be able to replace her full-time income. So don't, don't wrongfully extrapolate those ideas. We're just giving you a case study so we can use her as we go through some of these important steps. So you might ask yourself, well, what is it that Sophia can do to make her cell phone repair business a success? And she's going to complete the four planning steps over a two-year period. And as her plan, as her business grows, her planning approaches will change. And again, we'll talk about those four steps here momentarily. So you'll want to be able to feel free to pause this recording as needed and reflect what we're learning as how it applies to your business. So let's ask the question, where are you in the planning process? And this is important, please don't skip over it. So go ahead and go to page five of the participant guide. And I do have these questions extracted on the screen here. So I'll read them to you, we'll discuss them briefly, but you're going to want to record your answers in your participant guide. So first question is, I know where I am in starting this business, what I want to benefit from it, and what size of business I need to achieve. So what does that mean? 
Well, is your goal simply to earn some extra income, kind of to create a side gig? Is it to replace your full-time income? Is it to, to grow something very significant where you can uh, build your retirement or, or employ others? We, we, we're kind of figuring out the scale here. What is the goal that you're trying to accomplish? Because depending upon your end goal, it can very much affect the planning process, can't it? The second, so you, I'm sorry, go ahead and on the page five in the participant guide, you're going to respond if you're completed with this first step, if you're in process, or you've just started it. So you're gonna record that. Then the second question, which is labeled as B on page five of the participant guide is, I have a business idea that I've shared with lots of people, including potential customers. A Little bit of a loaded question, isn't it? So it's not just something I have in my mind that maybe I've talked to a couple people about, but to what extent have you broadcast this out, including to potential customers? So then go ahead and write on page five of the participant guide, if you've completed this step, if you're in process, or you've really not started it yet, C is, I know how much money I need to open my business. Now, this is assuming that you're pre-launch. If you're already in the startup phase, which means you've already started, then you may be beyond this. But if you're, you're contemplating starting a business, we need to know at least what it's going to cost to start. And, and we'll do some exercises to help you with that today. But the, uh, the question is, is this step completed for you and your business? Is it in process or not yet started? Next is, I know how much money I will need to keep operating for at least six months. See the difference? The first question, or the prior question was to get it started. The analogy I use is to flip the switch on so you're able to help start helping customers versus this one is how much I'm going to need to keep operating for six months. And again, that's part of the exercise that we'll go through. Now, this is a continued, same set of questions. I have a written business plan that has been reviewed by experts. And again, you'll mark on page five of the participant's guide, complete, in process, or started. Next, I know where to locate all the funding I need to open it and to operate it for at least six months. If you know the answer to this one, you're really ahead of the game because most small business owners don't. And that's why they're frankly often enrolling in our small business certification so we can prepare and be able to find the funding that you need. So it's okay. You know, there's no wrong answers to any of these. It's just simply a self-evaluation of where you're at. It's not a judgment. And then lastly, have you already opened your business and you're actually running it? So that is question G on page five of the participant's guide. And again, if you need to pause this uh, video at any time to complete the steps as we're going through it, that is perfectly fine. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the four-step planning model. And I think this is really good to understand, as I mentioned before, it's not just, oh, sit down and develop a business plan. There's a process most likely that we're going through and we'll talk about those today. So in summary, step one is called the back of the napkin plan, and that's the go or, or no-go decision. It's just the preliminary research and planning, and also is, is business ownership a, a good fit for you? Step two, and again, we'll talk about each of these in much more detail. Step two is the resource plan. If it's a go decision, in other words, yes, I want to do this, then we need to figure out what resources we need to get the light switch turned on. Step three is the full business plan. We'll talk about that just a little bit today, but more importantly, after the session today, we're gonna to actually work with you to build that business plan. That's part of what we do together. And then step four is the ongoing action plan. Almost like having a, a business coach or a business consultant that is assisting you on an ongoing basis because we don't want to stop with planning after step three. 
All right, now in the case of Sophia here, her four stages is diagrammed out here, and I think it's interesting to see the relationship. So if we look in the bottom left-hand corner, she started with some idea, and, and, and I read that to you if you remember a couple minutes ago. She had this idea, she wanted to own her own business and was going to repair cell phones and small appliances. So at that point, it was very loose. Just it, it, And it's pretty much where every business idea starts. We, we rarely go from being pre-contemplative to all of a sudden, oh, I have a complete business plan with financial projections, right? That's too good to be true. So the back of the napkin plan, which we'll talk more about in the next slide, what that includes, but that started and it took her almost a year just to get through that. Then she started developing her resource plan, which you see there in kind of the, the orangish rectangle box and that overlapped, that took quite a while. And then she built out her business plan and improved her credit score. Now, when it comes to credit, don't worry too much about that. There are many different sources of capital. We'll talk more about those in subsequent uh, lessons or modules. Some are concerned with personal credit, some aren't. So don't assume that you have to have great credit to, to start a business or even to get funding. But in her case, that was part of, of her priorities she needed to resolve. And then she actually didn't start her business until year two. So when you see the green box there at the top right, that didn't actually start until year two. So what do we take away from this? You know, your timelines could be very different and maybe we could move forward very, very quickly, but it is important to understand the planning process. So let's go ahead and dig into step one, which we call the back of the napkin plan. And I think maybe most famously, Southwest Airlines, one of the most successful airlines, is commonly known for having started its business on the back of a napkin. Now, for Sophia, her back of the napkin plan is, is real basic, right? It was to fix smartphones, tablets, maybe appliances, um, maybe more repairs later. She needed to figure out what her credit score was to, to be able to access the type of capital she was pursuing. Uh, does she need a website? Who are her competitors? Who's already out doing this? Where can she find help? And is she ready for all of this? So the back of the napkin plan is just high level, a few basic questions. And again, we call it the go or no go. Is, is it worth pursuing or not? So some key questions on step one. And again, I'd like you to go to steps, I'm sorry, page seven of your participant guide. And there are some, there's a specific grid I'd like you to fill out that's going to apply to you what we're learning about Sophia's business. So page seven of the participant guide. So we start by asking, well, what are the benefits that you want to get from your business? As we talked about earlier, is this just a side gig? Is this to replace your income? Is this to, to become wealthy? You know, any of those are okay, but the scale of what we're trying to accomplish definitely affects our planning process. What size of business do I need to achieve those benefits? So for example, in Sophia's case, her goal was within two years to replace her full-time income. Well, that's pretty easy to quantify, right? She knows how much she's making now. And so that isn't how much gross revenue her business needed to make. That's how much net revenue was needed. In other words, after all of her sales for all the repairs and services she offers, at, and then she pays all the business expenses, what's left over needed to be enough. So we need to be able to, to determine the, the size that we have to get to, to achieve the benefits. And then have I identified a real business opportunity? I can tell you through my years of working with small businesses, it's not unusual to, to converse, to visit with small business owners or prospective small business owners that have a vision, they have a dream, they have a passion, but sometimes it doesn't really translate into a profitable business model. And I could give you a number of examples where it didn't, but that's frankly part of the benefit of the planning process 
is to vet through, is this a good idea or not? You know, maybe it would just be a hobby. And, and if that's okay with you, consistent with the, the first bullet here, if all you're looking to do is have an outlet for something you're passionate about, then maybe a hobby is okay. But if we need predetermined quantifiable benefits, we, we need to make a certain amount of money, we've got to vet through this and make sure it's, it's, it's viable. And then also we need to look at what type of assets am I going to need to purchase, to rent or lease? Can I do this by myself or am I going to need to hire people? And there's worksheets in our participant guide to, to help you through this process. Okay, so let's move on to step two. So step one was the back of the napkin plan. Step two on the resource plan, and we're gonna go down to pages eight and nine for examples of Sophia's resource plan, and then we're gonna build your resource plan in the subsequent pages of the participant guide. Now, in Sophia's case, she determined for space, equipment, and supplies, she needed about 18,250. And you'll see a breakdown of her resource plan, again, on page eight, in terms of office space, desk and chairs, smartphone, furniture, office supplies, marketing material, and so forth. And then secondly, she determined that she wouldn't, uh, oh, she would need some new skills. And so that's breaking, broken down on section B at the top of page nine, the skills that she would need to gain. Because it's okay to come up with a business plan or a business concept, a business idea, and not know everything that you need to know. So it's, it's okay to budget for and plan for developing new skills so you can be more successful. Then we get to staff, which is in box C of page nine of the participants guide. And this is something I really want to you know, emphasize to you and we'll dig into it more in the third lesson, which is on financial planning. If we're going to run a business properly and expect to, to increase our likelihood of success, there's certain things we need to do. And so rather it be setting up the business properly, which isn't today's topic, or tracking revenue and expenses, which again is, is module three, but it, it gets to bullet three here. We're gonna need QuickBooks or something like QuickBooks to track our revenue and expenses. We could do it ourselves or we could outsource it to an accountant or bookkeeper, but we're going to encourage you as we go through this journey together to set up your business properly so you're positioned for success and compliance, because how in the world are you going to do your tax returns if you have not properly tracked revenue and expenses? All right, so back to Sophia then. Her other expenses which are in section D on page nine of the participant guide. And then her total that she anticipates that she needs is $21,000. Now, yours could be a lot less or a lot more. We're not saying that she needs to come up with 21,000 out of her pocket. And if you read in the participant guide, you'll see she doesn't have $21,000. So we're just putting together what the startup cost would be, what it would cost to flip the switch on and start having clients. I worked with a client that started a restaurant, a franchise. We needed $1.2 million just to flip the switch on because of the franchise fee and the equipment and all the startup cost. And of course, your idea may be even more expensive than that, or it might be a lot less expensive than that. It doesn't really matter how many dollar, uh, dollars are involved with this, but it's the process that we need to go through. Final comment on this slide, as you see there towards the bottom, her living expenses are not included. So we didn't build in how much money she needs to earn and take home. We're looking objectively at the startup cost, but disregarding income that she needs from this. So it's hard cost to get the business up and going. All right, next slide, and it's continuing on step two. Now at the very bottom of step nine, we see her 
her reconciliation. So we determined on the prior slide, she needs 21,000 to start this business. So that's a carryover. And then now we're figuring out how much she's bringing to the table, her owner's equity. And in, in her case, she's bringing 7,000 to the table. Well, you do the, the subtraction and we're short 14,000 to start this business. So we're gonna figure out whether it come from equity or debt, where that 14,000 is gonna come from for Sophia. And we're gonna go through a similar exercise with you. So certainly you don't have to have all the money that you need to start up your business, but we do need to determine how much money it's gonna to take to start if you've not started yet and how much you're contributing and then figure out where to get the rest from. All right, so in terms of resource planning ideas, it is really helpful to talk to others. And we talked about the, the definition of stakeholders earlier. So these could be competitors and sometimes competitors will talk to you, sometimes not. In many cases, when we're working with small business owners, we'll encourage them to find like businesses in other geographic areas that they're not competitive with. I have a client that's starting a franchise buying a UPS store. Well, she's developing or planning to open a UPS store in a specific location. So we can identify similar markets in other parts of the country. And then she, part of her homework is to go talk to the owners of those UPS franchises and other markets to learn from. So we can talk to stakeholders, competitors, and other business owners for ideas to help vet through. If we have a business that needs a physical location and not all do, then what would be an ideal location? Locating discounted equipment and supplies. For my client that I mentioned about the UPS store, we actually identified by going through that process of talking to other UPS store owners, we found a UPS store in a different market that was closing and we were able to buy equipment from that closed UPS store and reduce our costs considerably. Pros and cons of buying in bulk versus having too much inventory that affects cash flows. So again, what we're doing is we're saying that this is part of the resource planning. Resource planning, step two, is how much do I need to flip the switch on and get started? So here we're going through a bulleted list of some of the points of consideration of figuring out how much resources we need to flip that switch. If we do need employees here on bullet four, how much should we pay them? right? They would like to be paid more. You might like to pay them less, but of course we need to be able to attract and retain talent based upon your, your business's needs. Some businesses like McDonald's, McDonald's restaurants, they have such good training that they tend to pay low and have high turnover, but they have such good planning or training in place that it's fairly easy to plug and play in the next per person for the job where you may not have the desire to have that turnover, you may not have all the training in place, and so getting and retaining the right talent for a long period of time might be even more important for you. So those are variables that will impact how much you pay. Taking in consideration taxes, of course. Insurance, there's going to be insurance that every small business owner needs. And we'll work through in the subsequent modules of this program of what some of that insurance should need to be. But there's going to be expenses to properly set up a business. Now, of course, we can seek to minimize those expenses, but we need to set the business up right. If we don't set the business up right, we're much less likely to be successful and sustainable and no one wins from that. And then paying for services, you know, whether it be websites or website hosting or, or many other variables, there, there's some expenses that give you the option, hey, pay up front and get a discount, 10%, 20% discount or pay monthly. We need to vet through that because that's part of our startup cost for flipping that switch on. And ultimately, are you ready to go to that next step? So our next step is step three, actually creating the business plan. This is where we get really involved with you 
and I'll describe that more in a moment. But let's go ahead and go to page 13 of the participant guide. And page 13 gives you an overall outline. We're going to go deeper than that as we're actually building your business plan out together. But there is a helpful outline pulled from the SBA on page 13. So overall, the concept of a business plan is we want to tell the story that makes your idea come alive. As I mentioned earlier, you, you have the passion and the dream and the vision, but we need to be able to convey that in writing to others, especially, especially if we're looking to raise capital because they need to better understand what your business is, what it does, who your customers are, how you're going to market, how you're going to sell, who your competitors are, how much profit we anticipate generating so we can support the money that we're seeking to either borrow or have invested and so forth. When we develop a business plan together, and I know this can be unnerving, but we're going to actually plan out three years, 36 months, and that's typical for what investors and or lenders would want to see. I'm the first one to admit who in the world knows what my revenue is going to be in month 33 or 34 or even month three, but we, we need to, to make some assumptions, state those assumptions, extrapolate that into projections, and then it can change as we go along, but we need to have a 36 month projection. We're going to help you do that. And so we need to have this business plan clearly outlined, including the key financial metrics. One of the things that we'll also do in your business plan is do an industry analysis. So in your industry, what are some key metrics like average profit margin and contrast that to, to ours, to, to your business plan. And if there's a vast difference, something's wrong probably right? If you're going to be a whole lot more profitable than all of your competitors, then you must have a real key strategic advantage, or we didn't plan too well. We've overlooked some expenses. But again, we're going to help you uh, with step three, and we'll start that immediately after this lesson. Now, in terms of Sophia's business plan, uh, and you'll see as, as you go along in the participant guide, she was able to work on improving her credit score she met with her banker and got feedback and advice. She took a class on business plan writing, and that's essentially what we're helping you do here after the lesson today. She shared with her family and friends and got input, valuable input, not just positive input that's, oh, that sounds great, but have you thought about this or have you thought about that? Challenging constructive criticism helps us improve our planning. Again, as we showed you on her timeline, it took a while. It took two years for her to flip the switch and go live. It, it may not take you near that long, but with that, she was able to raise the capital, improve her credit scores, and launch her business. Now, you might ask, where does money come from? And we're referring to page 15 now of the participant guide. You can read on page 15, more than I'll summarize here, but what I want you to take away from it is that there are many different sources of capital and each have their own, what I'm going to call underwriting criteria requirements. As I mentioned earlier, some care about personal credit scores, some don't. Some care about being in business a certain time in business uh, or having business tax returns already. Others don't. So don't make the mistake to think that there's only one way to get money to start or grow a business. That's really half the battle, and that's what we're here to help you with. But there are such things as angel investors, and we have a number of clients that we're helping get funded with angel investors currently. There's bootstrapping, just using your own money and, and, and doing it on a tight budget to get it up and going. Crowdsourcing pulling from friends and family members, incubators. And there's a, a new phenomenon called virtual incubators. And if you're interested in that, that's what would let us know. That, that's where there's ongoing assistance where you're not taking out loans or giving up equity in your business, 
but providing kind of an all-inclusive package of resources to help you get up and going. There's different local and state economic development organizations that might be able to offer financial support. There's peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, small business loans, some through the SBA, some not SBA guaranteed, as well as venture capital. So in summary, money to start a business falls usually under two categories, debt or equity. Debt is money that we borrow and we promise to pay back. Equity is not money that we owe as a debt, but we get equity investment either from our own pocket or from others because the equity investor is presuming that there'll be some future benefit to them rather in growth of the business and, and some future payouts. All right, so in terms of, of being strategic when we're creating a plan, we see a sailboat here and we're trying to figure out, well, how would we meet up or how, how would we reach the sailboat? How would we steer? Well, we need to know where we're going. So we need to plan for the future. We need to plan for change and recognize that, that, that change will occur. When we put together that 36 month financial projection, it will not be stagnant. And in fact, if we're doing a good job, every month we're gonna compare actual to projections and revise accordingly. We're gonna make mistakes. We're going to have some successes and failures along the way. We need to learn from those mistakes and adjust course. We want to seek to minimize risk where possible, but we need an action plan, an action plan to remain strategic. And so that takes us into step four. So if you remember, step one was back of the napkin plan. Step two was the resource plan. What's it gonna to take to get this thing started? Flip the business switch. Step three, the planning process was developing a, a true lender compliant, full-fledged business plan with financial projections, which we're gonna be working on with you here after this lesson today. And step four is referring to that ongoing plan. And you'll see on page 16 of the participant guide more about her ongoing plan uh, at the bottom of, of page 16 and then there's an action plan template for you based upon smart goals which i'll introduce in just a second that is on page 17. so let's talk about smart goals smart goals are it's an acronym and so the s stands for specific so when we have ongoing planning we want to have specific goals so for example, I want to increase my customers by 500 within three months. So that's specific. So S for SMART goals is specific. It needs to be measurable. So something that we can measure, that we can count to determine did we hit it or not. The A in SMART goals stands for attainable. It's something that's within our reach. You know, so if I had a, a real passion for space travel and I see this guy Elon Musk is doing pretty well with SpaceX now. I'm thinking mm, maybe maybe I'll go raise a billion dollars and form a competitor to SpaceX. That's not realistic or attainable for, for me. Maybe for you, but we need to be within reach. And this is hard because sometimes we'll see small business owners, entrepreneurs come to us and what they're trying to accomplish isn't consistent with their current reality. So we need to either break it down into smaller steps or sometimes even change where we're trying to go. Because again, I'm in no position to start a competitor to SpaceX. Uh, I hope that you're in the position to be able to fund whatever business model that you envision, but we, we just may have to start on a little bit of smaller scale if there's an inconsistency. And that's what we're talking about in the A of SMART goals, making sure that they're within our reach, needs to be relevant, and then timely. We need to have a time associated with it. So that's the acronym for SMART goals. And we can assist you with that on an ongoing basis, or you could do that uh, on your own. But it is important at least have monthly SMART goals of what do I want to attain this month?
and then have maybe a, an accountability partner to reconcile at the end of the month. Well, did you meet those SMART goals or not? Uh, if not, why? And what are our SMART goals for the subsequent month? So some summary key points here to go through. There's more than one way to plan. And in fact, there's a full planning process with those four planning steps that we've talked about. And certainly the types of plans that you need will change as your business grows and evolves. It is important, it is important to make time to write a business plan. That's our job to help you with that uh, at the end of this lesson, but don't skip that. I know that you may be experienced or confident enough that you think, I don't really need to get this in writing, but, but we do. We're going to vet through the ideas. We have a much higher likelihood of, of ongoing success if we have a written business plan, and it's crucial if we're looking for third-party funding. So let's talk about some benefits and, and risk of planning versus not. We'll do benefits first. Well, You'll know where you're at and where you're going. That makes sense, kind of that sailboat analogy we used earlier. Most often you'll save time and money by planning. You'll be able to ask great questions, get stakeholders involved. And again, stakeholders could be potential customers, uh, could be potential business partners and so forth. We'll be able to make more logical decisions because the human mind is creative, right? And, and sometimes we can just kind of pick and choose what's fun and light and pleasant, but there's sometimes more difficult, more demanding aspects that we need to plan for. And if we get it reduced to writing, we're much more likely to vet through that than just frankly skip over it. We can measure progress on tangible goals and you know, we, we have to have money. We're gonna to have to have adequate capitalization to start and grow your business and planning helps us do that. Risk of not planning, well, the opposite of some of what we said, we could end up wasting time and money. And, and I've gone through this process and in some cases, as I made reference to earlier, once we finished the business plan and financial projections, I've had clients that said, mm, never mind, this, this doesn't make sense based upon the competitive environment or the cost or or the current economic circumstances of our, our nation, our community, maybe it's not the right time or the right business model. That is not a failure at all. That's a success. You came up with the concept, we've gone through the process, and then if you make the decision not to move forward with your business based upon the data gathered and, and the results, that's a success because to, to cut your losses and stop then versus to continue on is going to most likely save you time and money. Risk of not planning would be doing too much and missing opportunities to delegate, risk being burnt out, confusing or alienating investors. And we want to make sure that we do the math and that ties back to exactly what I was saying before. Ultimately, profit is the goal of any business and profit is measured by revenue coming in minus expenses going out. And we need to create a plan to do all that we can to ensure profitability. All right, so to summary, summarize, if, if there's questions that you have, you can let us know. Of course, this is recorded on demand. We love teaching this in person. And so if you're part of a, a group or organization that would like to have us in, we can teach all four of these modules one day and actually knock it out in person, but you're going through it uh, online on demand. We'd love you to, to think back, what have you learned? And of course, we'll ask you some of those questions as part of the pre post test. But can you think about some key points or items that you've learned by going through this process? How would you evaluate the training? We also are looking for more financial literacy educators that help us set up host relationships and, and help with the instruction of the classes. Now, you don't necessarily have to be in front of the class or teaching it via uh, Zoom or YouTube like I'm doing, but you can just facilitate. 
and that's an opportunity to help others and get paid. And if you're interested in that, send, to, send us your resume and, and we can visit more. There, there's no cost to be a financial literacy educator, of course. All right, pre and post test evaluation. Again, we should have done the pre, the before training earlier. Now uh, go ahead and fill out, which is on page, what, 23 of the participant guide, the, the post, the after, which is on the right hand side. And uh, the evaluation form, if, if you have that, which is page 24, go ahead and fill that out. We may be collecting that from you. We always collect it if it's the in-person class online. It's a little bit of a different animal. And if you don't have access to your login to the business plan software we use, stop this recording right now and email us at access at IIMFL. Institute for Improved Minority Financial Literacy org, because we need to apply what we've just learned. And so if you don't have login yet, that's okay. Go ahead and email us so we can get that to you. All right. Well, we covered a lot of information in a relatively short amount of time. Thank you so much. We look forward to working with you, completing the other three modules, and helping you start and or grow your business to be successful. Thanks so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.